simultaneously with the well overdue call for justice by many communities of color, especially African Americans, America is at a pivotal point and it's time for us all to educate ourselves on the issues, how they affect different communities of color and minority faiths and try to collectively find solutions that respect the dignity and culture of every citizen and provide them with proper public services that support their goals and dreams. Hate crimes are on the rise in America. Countless individuals, as well as community centers, religious institutions, and private property have come under grave danger from threats and crimes motivated by bias. From Charleston to Pittsburgh to New Zealand, crimes targeted against faith communities, especially minority faiths, has risen dramatically in the last few years. The African American community has been and continues to experience police violence and discrimination well after the Civil Rights Act and the election of an African American president. And dramatic underreporting of hate crimes still makes it impossible to understand the full scope of the problem. So we're here tonight to get a personal glimpse into how hate, bigotry, and racism affect our communities. This is why we're fortunate to have a diverse panel that will each provide their personal experiences and stories and share their suggestions for how we might together move toward collectively towards results or results oriented solutions. It's our time to listen and learn as much as we can about each other's concerns. So the topic of addressing hate, bigotry and racism is a very broad one. The goal of our program is to create a starting point for discussion, engagement and dialogue. This will be the first of a series of community conversations we hope to continue to have as we take a deeper dive in future events of this kind. So I wanna start by thanking each one of our panelists and to personally thank my team, Alexandra Ritchie, who uh, greeted all of you and um, is welcoming you into our discussion um, as people continue to arrive. Ken Spiker, um, who has been instrumental in um, helping with uh, you know, all aspects of the program. And I must say that Alexandra and Ken and everyone, really Simon and Colin Brick, all of whom are on the call tonight, um, wave guys so everybody can see who you are. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful to you all for helping me put together tonight's program. Um, and Colin and Simon especially deserve credit for helping to design the flyers and the logistics. So kudos to them. Um, so everybody, like I said, they'll all be assisting me throughout the course of our event tonight. Just some quick housekeeping rules and ground rules. Um, the session will be recorded. Um, can I do that? I'm, oh, you're recording it. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> each, panelist, um, our, each panelist is going to give their opening remarks, and then we'll open it up to the audience for Q&A. Please, if you have questions, type them in the chat box, and we'll address them after the speaker's remarks. Please keep yourselves on mute. Um, I can't uh, emphasize this more just because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it'll reduce the background noise and allow others to speak without interruption. So I really appreciate it if you guys can, can do that. Um, we'll also be distributing information about resources you can tap into, and those will be posted on our Arlington Dems Interfaith Caucus Facebook group um, page in the next few days. Finally, after our program, um, we're going to allow you to evaluate us. We're going to send you an evaluation form, and we'd really like to hear what you have to say. Um, what do you, you know, how well do you think that our program addressed um, the, the topic? Um, is there something we could have done better? And um, we'd also like to hear some uh, suggestions from you on other topics you'd like to hear more about. What would you like for us to take a deeper dive into, for example, or other, you know, other issues you'd like to see addressed? So um, if you could do that, it, it would provide us with, you know, a, a tremendous amount of valuable information on how best to serve you going forward. Okay, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Um, I just, um, I just wanted to tell you, first of all, before I go any further, I, I believe that um, Congressman Beyer may not be able to stay for the duration of the program. Um, his office has informed me that he may have to leave for a scheduled vote in the House. So um, I, will, um, I will introduce him first. Um, and uh, if, 
uh, if that's okay, um, I'll, I'll introduce him and allow him to speak first, and then I will allow, um, I will introduce the remaining uh, speakers after um, the congressman has had a had some time to um, after his remarks. So I'll start out with Congressman Beyer. Um, congressman Don Beyer is serving his third term as a U.S. representative from Virginia's eighth district, representing Arlington, Alexandria. Falls Church in parts of Fairfax County. He serves on the House Committees on Ways and Means and Science, Space, and Technology. He is the Vice Chair of the Joint Economic Committee and is a co-chair of the New Democrat Coalition's Climate Change Task Force. Um, I'll also put in a, a personal uh, observation on my part. I, I think he is an exceedingly humble public servant. Um, and does not always express his credentials. He is also a former Lieutenant Governor of the state of Virginia and a former ambassador to um, Switzerland. So with that, I will um, take it away, Congressman Beyer. Congressman Beyer. Are you on mute? I hope we didn't have to leave. Kitten, but Fatima, how does that work? Is that better? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great, great, great. Thank yeah. you. I, I thank you so much. I for mute being and unmute that. myself. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I'm so sorry. I can't. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm 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 sorry. I'm not there, uh, staring at you in person on the Zoom thing. Um, being. Yeah, I just turned 70, which I still feel like I'm 37, but I probably need a 37-year-old to show me how to get the camera and the microphone to work in my phone because um, I'm sitting in my car in front of the Capitol. Um, I will come back and forth, Fatima, because we've got three votes um, this, this evening, about 40 minutes apart on the largest infrastructure bill probably in American history, one and a half trillion dollars. Um, that's going to do all kinds of wonderful things, including putting people out of work, uh, people who, you know, were in that three and a half percent, putting them back to work. Wow. But thanks for having me here on this panel on challenging hate, bigotry and racism. And by the way, Kate Schiffler is on the Zoom call, too, who awesome. I inherited from Jim Moran. And Kate has spent much of the last six years working on these issues. And she's just terrific. Well, she's been and, and I can't, helpful. Yes, thank you. <laughs> great. Yeah, and I can't think of a better topic to be focused on right now. Look, we have a president who only this weekend retweeted a video of somebody shouting "White Power, White Power," reinforcing what his administration has been about: dividing us one against the other around the theme of white nationalism. We've seen it in the people he's hired, the Steve Bannons and the Stephen Millers. Uh, we've seen it in his rhetoric towards Asian Americans and Latinos. We've seen it in his immigration policies. Um, by the way, we're going to vote on the No Ban Act, I think, this month, which I'm really excited about. And we've certainly seen it in his failed reaction to the movement surrounding George Floyd's murder. This president perpetuates a culture of hate, bigotry, and racism. As General Jim Mattis uh, said, Yes, for the first time in history, we have a president who divides us rather than tries to heal us. So, Fatima, you asked me here specifically to talk about the Jabara Hire No Hate Act. So this bill started as a reaction to the culture Trump's cultivated, but, but really this has been an issue long before Donald Trump. Because you know, over our lives, countless individuals, community centers, religious institutions, private property have been attacked, killed, vandalized. I grew up in the 50s and 60s in the civil rights movement. We just have to think about how many people, mostly black, but even white, were killed because they were daring to speak out on race. And these crimes have been motivated by, by bias, whether against race, color, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability. Those years I was in Richmond, um, I listened to debate after debate about why hate crimes couldn't be expanded to women, why they couldn't be expanded to people of different sexual preference. We didn't even talk about gender identity or disability back then. You know, the FBI confirms this too. 
during Trump's time in office, we've broken records on the number of new hate crimes and also the amount of hate crimes that have resulted in death. You only need to think of the Tree of Life or Emanuel Church or the continued lives of black trans women that we continue to lose. But the No Hate Act, with my interest in engaging on this, really be- began when they had a hate crime against the local mosque out in my district, out off Route 7. And then we had more vandalism at a local Jewish community center a few days later. And at a sign of the times, even more recently, there's been intentional vandalism of Black Lives Matter signs. I was there at Tinner Hill in Falls Church a couple of weeks ago when they unrolled a beautiful eight-foot-tall banner on George Floyd, which, needless to say, was stolen a few nights later. You know, it's amazing. We are one of the most educated, diverse, liberal, in, in, in the sense of progressive um, districts in the country, and it's happening here. Can you imagine what's happening everywhere else and worse? So we just had we just have to celebrate diversity. So I went to the mosque and I invited all the local congressional leaders to come join me, and we called the event "Members to Mosques." And that was way back before Donald Trump was reelected or was elected. Uh, but we wanted to be, to be a more public face, so I introduced a resolution in the House condemning the rise of Islamophobia and violence towards Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim. As a quick aside. Um, you know, many of us have been deeply involved in the injustice of the the at least second degree murder of Bijan Gesar down on the parkway. Um, what's not gone missing from people is that his license plate said Bijan and that he was a person of color, a Persian with a black beard when the police officers put 10 bullets into his car, uh, four into him when he had done nothing wrong. ProPublica's documenting hate had done a Project had done a very good job reporting on the prevalence of these crimes, but also, and critically, the under-reporting of these crimes. So that's when Kate and I and our team decided we had to do a much better job of tracking and reporting hate crimes if we were going to fully understand what's happening in our communities. And as a businessman, I learned a long time ago, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So we know that some police departments don't send any data to the FBI or claim to have no hate crimes including a bunch of cities with more than 100,000 people. Approximately 12% of law enforcement agencies didn't report a single hate crime last year to the FBI. And the 2,700 city and police county departments hadn't submitted a single hate crime in the last six years. And the 16,000 that do report, many say no hate crimes. You know, we're reporting, we have zero. And that would be great if it were true. So I've always long held that the more transparency and the more data we have, the better we'll be able to address this. Um, So the the law really allows the reporting of hate crimes to be inconsistent and incomplete. And then our ability is inconsistent and incomplete. So this is one of those rare bills I had that the FBI actually likes and wants to help and addresses. There's a a sad article that says that even some of the FBI offices underreport or don't report hate crimes. So this bill. It um, won't be perfect, but it will move us in a huge way to ensure better hate crime reporting and a more effective response when it happens. And uh, I was thrilled that after four or five years of fighting for this, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee back in February, Kate and I went to see him, Jerry Nadler, and he promised to put it on the calendar in March or April. And then coronavirus hit. And there was no calendar in March or April. Um, but we were very fortunate that Speaker Pelosi and Jerry Nadler folded it into um, the CARES bill. Um, and Kate, correct me if it's one in the HEROES bill. It's one of the, the two big coronavirus bills. Um, and so now it goes to the Senate, and the Senate has to pass it also. But we have some good support over there, too, led by um, the senator from Connecticut, uh, whose name jumps out of my head. Those senators, you can never keep track of them, too many of them. Um, and so this is, we're really excited about this, and this is really important. And it's a small piece um, of an overall policy agenda that has to address racism. Uh, I'm halfway through um, Professor Kendi's book called Stamped from the Beginning. It's a 450-page 
history of racist ideas in America. It's very, very powerful. His second book is selling out everywhere called the How to Be an Anti-Racist. I think one of the ways we can be an anti-racist is to make sure that we measure every hate crime, where it happens, when it happens, and that we hold people accountable for it. So, Fatima, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. And um, I will be back and forth with votes, but I will stay on this call um, intermittently as long as I can. Thank you. Well, we're honored to have you. Uh, the pleasure is all ours and the honor is all ours, uh, Congressman Beyer. Um, we really appreciate your being here, especially on such a busy evening. And um, we hope you'll be back um, and forth because I, I know that um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people in the audience that are very curious and that have, you know, are, are very interested in this issue and would like to ask questions. So we, we'd like to see you back if you can possibly make it. So thank you. Pat. Okay. Well, I, excuse me now. I'll be back in five or six minutes. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. So with that, um, I'm going to go on to uh, uh, introduce the rest of the panel. Um, got a couple of people. So. Um, all right, I'm going to start with Kofi, uh, Kofi Annan. And contrary to what many may believe, uh, Kofi is not the former Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> you never know. I, I know you get that a lot. <laughs> you must. Um, so with that, I, I'll start with Kofi's uh, bio. Kofi Annan founded The Activated People, a national digital magazine dedicated to raising awareness about social justice issues. In addition, he spearheaded the creation of the Northern Virginia Equity Agenda Coalition, which is comprised of over 20 organizations and marks the largest coalition of its type dedicated to promoting racial and gender equity. The NOVA EAC has accomplished a great deal since its founding, including successfully lobbying for the release of over three dozen nonviolent incarcerated individuals from the Fairfax County Detention Center to reduce the risk of the spread of COVID-19 in the jail. Successfully lobbied for the collection and release of racial and location data of positive COVID-19 cases in Fairfax County. Successfully lobbied for the creation of a COVID-19 equity task force. Twice successfully lobbied local and state governments to extend eviction moratoria to prevent the eviction of tenants impacted by COVID-19, successfully lobbied for face masks to be worn in public buildings and grocery stores and on public transportation in Fairfax County, and raised over $6,500 to purchase over 15,000 face masks for lower income and minority Northern Virginia residents. Stay with me, folks. This this guy is very talented, so I've got one more paragraph. We, we you don't have to read everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is this is, right. this is important. So okay. Kofi previously served two terms as the president of the Fairfax County uh, NAACP. The branch led multiple successful advocacy efforts, including convincing the county to designate over $10 million for affordable housing and body police body worn cameras, helped draft the county's first police body worn camera policy, adopt uh, adoption of county funded study aimed at eliminating racial disparity in police use of force, reform of the county's school resource officer policy, which led to an almost 60% reduction in student arrests and successfully advocated for the Fairfax County Public Schools to reform their teacher hiring practices to help reduce discrimination against African American teachers. Under his leadership, the branch was awarded the Thalheimer Award, a national NAACP recognition as the best unit of its kind in the, in the, of its size in the country, excuse me. He also served as a Virginia State Conference NAACP Criminal Justice Committee Chair, where he led the first ever statewide criminal justice symposium. Mr. Anand proudly served eight years in the US Army. He holds a Master's of Science in International Relations from Troy University and a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice with a minor in Psychology from Tennessee State University. So, wow. Okay, I'm gonna go on to introduce uh, Kurunessa Faryad, um, known uh, to, among her Muslim friends and, and other friends as Huri. Um, Hurunessa Faryad is head of outreach and interfaith at the All Dulles Area Muslim Society, the Adams Center, where she oversees the outreach and public relations efforts of the center to educate the DMV and national community 
about the Adams Center and the American Muslim community it serves. She has been interviewed by national and international media outlets. Ms. Faryad also oversees the interfaith efforts at the Adams Center and is on the board of directors for VICPP, Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy, very impressive, an active member of MJAC, Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, DMV Muslim Rep for PCI, Peace Catalyst International, and other organizations. Ms. Faryad is the music director of America's first mosque youth choir, the Adams Beat, which is actively involved in interfaith and advocacy work. I will say that that's a fabulous group. I have heard them speak, uh, to speak. I've heard them sing at um, the, um, what's the play, uh, the, the, the um, the synagogue that that starts the Unity Walk in September. Washington um, Hebrew Congregation. Washington, thank you, Washington Hebrew Congregation, and they are really fabulous. Not not an act, an act not to be missed. Um, Haranessa is the founder and co-host of the Sister Act podcast, along with a female pastor and female rabbi co-hosts. The podcast focuses on lived experiences of life, faith, and resilience as American women from the three Abrahamic faith traditions. Conversations centered around shame, stigma, rights, and social justice issues in how faith addresses these topics. And finally, last but not least, I'm going to introduce to you Robert, uh, Walter Ruby. Um, Walter Ruby is a veteran activist in Muslim Jewish relations. From 2008 to 2017, in the position of Muslim Jewish relations director at the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, <coughs> he organized hundreds of twinning events bringing together thousands of Jews and Muslims in over 30 countries on five continents, including members of mosques and synagogues and Muslim and Jewish organizations. A resident of Washington, DC, Walter presently serves as executive director of Jews, Muslims, and allies acting together, Jamaat, J-A-M-A-A-T, of whom there are a number of um, members here in the audience. Thank you for, for being here. A grassroots community of Muslim Jewish and interfaith activists in Greater Washington and is coordinator of the Washington area chapter of Project Rosanna, which works to strengthen ties between Israelis and Palestinians through healthcare. Walter is currently writing a book with American Muslim writer Sabiha Rahman, who I, I also see in the audience. Sabiha, raise your hand. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, entitled, we refuse to be enemies, how Muslims and Jews can make peace, one friendship at a time, to be published in April 2021 by Arcade Publishers. And let's see, Walter has worked as a reporter and commentator for more than 40 years, mainly for American Jewish and Israeli publications. His articles and op-eds have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and other media. So, wow. Do we have some incredible people on our panel or what? So um, with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Kofi to start us out um, and uh, give your remarks. So take it away. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and, and I will come up with a short, uh, 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 abbreviated version of my bio. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you everyone for, for joining uh, um, this, this program here today. I'm, I'm really uh, honored um, for the opportunity to, to talk about these issues, especially with everything that's going on right now. Um, I think it's, we're living in really remarkable times. Um, and you know it's it's been over a month since the pro since the George Floyd was was killed, and we're still seeing people protesting on a daily basis um, throughout the country, and it's even spread throughout the world. Um, and it's it's uh you know I, I, I saw it on the news yesterday that um, you know that even Australia they were protesting uh, Black Lives Matter, and and it's just really a testament to. Um, just how everyone's just kind of waking up to to understand how how important this is and how how um, this has been a long time coming, and um, it's it's a it's a proud moment for me to for me to to be a witness and to be a part of and 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 to be able to to uh, uh, contribute in, in any way possible to to see how we how we become a uh, a better society at the at the uh, other end of this, and um, yeah, it's just really really touching. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we have to make sure that we we are cognizant of and, and are deliberate 
in, in, in going forward is that we don't just use this as, a, as an opportunity for to show a solidarity um, but we use it for an opportunity to to bring about meaningful change um, I don't I think that's honestly that's one of my biggest concerns is that we we march and we protest and we uh, 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 you know for 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 all this time and then you know we look back a year from now and you know, not much has changed, like, or, or, or it's, it's just, you know, slightly different. I think what people are asking for is, is we really want to see some dramatic changes and we, we want to re, reimagine the way we, we do, we have policing in, in our country and, and we don't want to just go through this endless cycle of, of, of um, anger and then apathy, anger and then apathy, because we've seen this before, we've seen this, you know, with, with uh, Trayvon Martin, we've seen it with Freddie Gray and we've seen it with, uh, you know, this, you know, as far as how, depending on how far back you want to go back, you know, um, my, uh, one of my first memories of, of dealing with police brutality, or at least having to, to witness it, it unfold was Rodney King. And, you know, we, we haven't really come that far if you, when, when we see these things happen. And in some ways, it's even gotten um, arguably worse in some, in some instances, because the incident with George Floyd, uh, one of the most remarkable points about that was, that officer, A, he, he, he did it for nine minutes. It, it, it was such a long, excruciating, painful thing to, to, to experience and to watch. Um, but then he also knew that he was being recorded at the same time. And so that tells you that, you know, he was, he was cognizant of, of, of what was going on. It, would, it, uh, it wasn't like some kind of a knee-jerk reaction. And he knew that it, he was being recorded, so he expected there to be some kind of um, uh, public outcry, but still felt secure enough um, in his in his job to do it. And that's those are two really troubling troubling um, uh, points, you know, uh, in, in all of this. So and so when you when you you look at that incident, then you look at um, you know the the fact that. A, a similar incident happened right in the middle of, of all this in Atlanta, where you had another unarmed black man that was shot. Um, you had, uh, I think there were multiple instances uh, during all of this was going on. They even had an incident right here in Fairfax County, where an officer tased uh, an unarmed black man who, um, for for what it would put, probably was some kind of a, a health crisis. Um, it 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 tells you that there's something that needs to fundamentally change. Um, and I think one of the, the things that I would, points I would like to, to bring up, and I think this is the most critical, is that usually when these things happen, people think of them like, well, this is a Ferguson issue, or this is a Baltimore issue, or this is, this is someone else's problem. This can't happen in our backyard. This isn't, this isn't how we do things in Fairfax. This isn't how we do things in Virginia. Um, our police are, are, are better than that, and, and we've been kind of conditioned to think that this is someone else's problem. Um, but I think what, we, what the world is, is waking up to, and I think what these protests are, are, are showing, is that people are waking up to the fact that this is, this is a, all of our problem. This is, this is rooted in our history. This is something that is, has been poisoned from the start. You know, our, our foundings uh, as a nation were birthed out of uh, racist ideals. Um, there was a genocide, there was slavery, there, was, there, was, there were things that, that didn't just go away, they never actually went away, and it, unless we uh, work to fight back against that in, in, in a really systemic way, um, then we aren't actually ever going to make, make the progress that we, that we need to make. As, we can't just have these race-neutral policies as Dr. Uh, 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 Ibram uh, X. Kendi uh, wrote, we have to actively fight against it and be deliberate in, 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 the, in our actions, in our policies. We have to be able to, willing to say things, this is, this is a policy that is specifically intended to benefit the African-American community. This is a policy that's intended deliberately to, to erase um, the discrimination that we, that we accept is happening in our own communities. Um, and and uh, it has to be it has to be deliberate. It has to be across the board. Um, the police instance, the instance we have with the police, as 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 horrific as they are, um, and as much attention as they're 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 de deservedly getting, we have to also understand that that is just a fruit 
from a tree that has been poisoned, right? So like that is just one symptom of a what is an actually larger systemic issue um, that the, you can't just uh, trim around the edges of this tree. You have to actually uproot the tree and plant some new seeds with some new ideas and some uh, in, in, in order to actually produce something that is um, working for everyone. Um, and so that is what I'm hoping that we come out of the, the tail end from this. I really would want to make sure that a year from now, we can look back and we could all be proud to say that we, we transformed the way, not just the way we did policing, but we also transformed the way that we, we look at housing, the way we look at education, the way we look at all of these things and, and look at these things deliberately through a lens of racial equity. So I'll pause there and again, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kofi. Uh, those were some very heartfelt remarks, and um, I, I'm sure they'll, you know, they're going to be a very important springboard for um, uh, for our discussion and, and for the questions that ensue. Um, from this point, I am going to go to her Nessel Fariad, and Clary, it's your turn. Thanks so much, Fatima. I first want to thank you so much for putting this together and having us here on this platform and having all these great people to have this conversation, which I think you, we could never have enough of. I want to start off with thanking Congressman uh, Don Beyer as well for really being an advocate for this no hate bill. I'm familiar with it because we've been working at it through MJAC, which is the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council. And we're trying to get people in Congress to uh, become more aware of it so they can sign on as well and making sure that hate crimes are reported and we're doing the best we can to make sure that whatever's going on in this country is, is highlighted and that these are issues that are plaguing all the cities across the country and that we need to work together and making sure that we're bringing those into light. As an American Muslim, um, just listening to what has been going on for so long in this country, but in the past few weeks has been a wake up call for a lot of people within the American Muslim community. Um, in our holy book in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, you know, God talks about justice, right? He says, you have to be just even if it's against yourself or even if it's against your family and your friends. So imagine how hard that would be that, you know, God is telling us that justice prevails everything. Even if you're the perpetrator of an act of crime or a, an act of injustice, you have to make sure that you yourself are keeping yourself accountable against that, right? So this concept of justice and justice for all is throughout our, our faith. And it's something that God is reliant on for us to actually execute as people of faith. Um, he even says, you know, there's there's tradition of the prophet where, you know, if the prayers that prayers of the oppressed are are always listened to by God, it doesn't matter what faith group they're from, right? The, the oppressed, the cries and the wails and the injustice that's happening to them, God hears it. And so, if God is hearing those, what are we supposed to do? Um, there's another hadith, which is another tradition of the prophet, where he you know, says that a, a, a white person is not superior over a black person and vice versa, and an Arab is not superior over a non-Arab and vice versa. So this concept of race was embedded in the foundation of Islam from the beginning, that no one can say, I am better than you because I'm whiter than you, or I'm you know, basing everything of my status based on my skin color. The only thing that God looks at is your piety and your intention and your humility, right? Because he created all of us. As Muslims, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white or anything in between. You are still created by the same God and we will go and stand in front of that same God regardless of our skin color. So if God is not making that as an issue, why are we making it? Why are we adding to this injustice that is actually happening and we're perpetuating the cycle over and over again? You know, and then there's another... Um, tradition where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon, upon him, said, he said, when you see an injustice, stop it with your hands. And if you can't stop it with your hands, stop it with your tongue. And if you can't even say anything from your tongue, then hate it in your heart. And hating it in your heart is of the weakest of the faithful. Right? So there's also a remedy of what we're supposed to do, that when we see injustice, we're actually physically supposed to go and stop it. And if we can't do that, we have to make sure we're speaking against it. And even then, if we can't do that, we have to hate it in our heart. Because if we don't even at least hate it in our heart, then we're, do we're being 
and the same line as those who are perpetuating the violence that we're okay with it. And that's not okay. You know, um, connecting this to who we are as Muslims in this country, we've seen a cycle of Islamophobia in the last, you know, you know, over two decades uh, on the rise and people not understanding who we are. And that's part of my job to educate people about who we are as an American Muslim community and giving them insights into our worship places and coming into our homes. And I talk a lot about my own personal struggle and life on my podcast. And I feel that that is a way for people to actually get to know who we are and what it is we go through, especially as a female Muslim woman in the position that I am right now. Um, but, you know, even though we're the ones receiving Islamophobic um, hatred and, and verbiage from people, there are still Muslims who don't really understand what racism means in this country and who they themselves are racist and who need to be educated. They need to be um, put, gone, you know, go through a process where they're actually learning about what racism means in this country. For over 401 years, what the enslaved have gone through, they have no idea, especially the immigrant uh, community who have come here as adults. You know, when you tell them about racism, they're like, what are you talking about? I have, that makes no sense to me. And it, it lets us know that we need to do a better job in educating them in the process of what has actually happened in this 401 years in this country, which they have actually no idea, right? And when you teach them things like how the system is built, it's actually built, you know, the, the, in, the racist policies that are part of this country are built, is built, they're built to relegate the black community. It's, it's set up to make the black community fail. And when you say these types of words, their eyes open. And for them, it's like, wait, what do you mean it's built in? And then, you know, you walk them through the process of what has actually happened in history and they're mind blown to see that the system is built to make sure that the black community never rises, whether it's in healthcare, housing, like Kofi mentioned, um, you know, rights within our judicial system, it's all rigged, right? For, against the black community. And it's our job when we say we wanna be allies to make sure that we're educating our own people who have no idea what's going on so that they can become allies and they can help you know, open up space and give platforms for the black community so that we can change these systems and policies that have plagued us for so long. Um, you know, at Adams, um, you know, we serve 25,000 Muslims in the Northern Virginia area. We're the second largest mosque in the country and the largest here in the DMV area. It's our job to make sure that we're teaching our community. So one of the things that I'm in charge of right now is bringing uh, race equity and, and uh, a, a training for our community and our staff and executive community and our board members to learn about race equal, uh, equity within our organization, but also giving a background of what the enslaved have gone through in this country, what racist policies actually exist, and making sure that the Muslim community here in at least Northern Virginia or even in the United States are aware of what has actually happened and where things stand today. Where someone who gets on a board uh, call that I was on, who is of a South Asian descent, um, is telling a whole board of, of white people on the, on the screening, there was this one black guy saying that, oh, there's no racism in this country because no one's racist to me. And I was like, what, wait, wait, hold up. You know, like I had to stop him and I had to tell him this is not about you as a brown man. You know, you're from the India subcontinent. This racist issues that's been going on in this country is not about you, it's not about me. And when, after I said that, it, that opened up the door for the one black guy on that call to say, let me tell you what it is. And he went on for 15 minutes. If I hadn't jumped in, that call would have ended and no one would have had this discussion. So we have to really understand what it means to be an ally. We need to understand what our job is when we're talking about bringing these things into light. You know, I, telling even Muslims that uh, the history of the enslaved, that one third of the slaves that were brought into the, this country um, during slavery were Muslim, right? People are shocked when they hear that. They were forced to convert by their slave masters, forced to live a different life than what they wanted to. And still that, that information, that knowledge gets, you know, lost in all the conversation, you know, telling them about the civil rights movement and how the civil rights movement, you know, brought people like myself into this country uh, as an immigrant. I came as a refugee uh, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. I came to this country when I was five years old. I grew up in Queens, New York City. And if it wasn't for that, and if it wasn't for President Reagan, who initiated all of this for someone like myself to just come to this country, I would not be able to 
live the life that I'm living now, I might not be a, a, alive today. So I owe it to the people who went through the civil rights movement. They paved the way for all of us. So we need to educate our community. We need to see that we're so connected and that we have to be advocates for one another. Thank you, Hori. That was, that was, a, that was a very passionate, um, you know, personal account and, you know, really appreciate um, your, you know, your sharing, um, sharing with us on a personal level, what, what all of this means to you and how, how it affects you. Um, we'll come back to that later, but um, I want to now go on to Walter Ruby and who was our last speaker and Walter, it's your turn. Well, thanks so much, Fatima, and thanks to Arlington Dems for putting this on and inviting me. It, it feels like a real privilege to be part of this with these amazing uh, speakers that uh, I'm sharing the thing with. Um, and uh, oh, just one very quick thing. Uh, you, you I didn't call me the executive director of uh, Jamaat, Jews, Muslims, and Allies Acting Together. And I should say that I'm, an, I'm an, a Jew uh, or a uh, one of the executive directors. So that's <laughs> one of them. Andre Bayless is also with us today. So I uh, wanted to, to say that. Um, so Andre, do you want to just wave uh, here yeah. so everybody can see who you are? There she is. There she is. Great. Okay. And Andra is the lady. She's known as the lady in white. If you see her at any programs, she's got white <laughs> hair. She's got a white uh, outfit. And she's, you know, a pretty amazing lady, which I'll tell you about later, but I don't want to interrupt uh, Walter's presentation, so please. Well, I totally agree with that. She definitely is a wonderful uh, partner in, in, in our work. Um, so let me talk about Jews in America and how we fit into this uh, American politics and culture and something about this moment. Um, so, so one question I think uh, that I'd like to really talk about a little bit is, so who are the Jews? Are we, are we an endangered minority or are we part of the ruling class? Um, I would say some of both, but overall we skew progressive. Um, you know, there's an old saw, this goes back many decades, saying um, economically uh, Jews are like Episcopalians, but they vote like Puerto Ricans. Um, so, um, of course, nowadays uh, Episcopalians are also skewing more liberal than perhaps they were a few decades ago. But nevertheless, Jews have been voting, I think have voted Democratic in every election since 1928. So why is that? Um, so here's some thoughts on that. Uh, most uh, American Jews are very proud of our role in the, in the civil rights movement, uh, not only in the 60s, but even going back earlier, back to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Jews played big ro uh, major roles in, in, in founding uh, the NAC NAACP and, and some other civil rights organizations. Of course, during the 60s, many Jews went south during the freedom summers of the 60s and some of you know that there were two, two uh, young Jews from Queens, New York, from Queens College, and uh, Schwerner and Goodman. Uh, uh, that was uh, their names that were, were killed along with a, uh, uh, a black colleague named Cheney uh, by the KKK in Mississippi that summer. And of course, they, they were let off scot-free eventually. Um, if you see the picture of Dr. Martin Luther King at the uh, Lincoln Memorial giving his I Have a Dream speech, you'll see Rabbi Joachim Prince, I believe it is standing right by his side. And there were many other Jews who were part of that. So why, why is that? Um, one of the things, I guess, if you go back to the, to the uh, origins of Judaism, uh, the, the Torah, the Old Testament into, uh, intones to, uh, informs us to welcome the stranger into our midst and show solidarity with the oppressed because we, were, we too were, were slaves in Egypt. Uh, for actually for 400 years, and I was just thinking earlier today that that's the exact for the same amount of time since the arrival of the first slave ship in, um, in Jamestown. So that's a significant uh, comparison. We went through many, you know, thousands of 2000 years of persecution in the diaspora after the destruction of the temple back in 70 AD until the recre recreation of the Jewish state. We remember pogroms and segregation in the Pale of Settlement in, in the Russian, and Pol Russian Empire just over a hundred years ago. Of course, there was the Holocaust, the, the ultimate uh, uh, you know, horror in which one, one out of every three Jews in the, wor in the world were, were massacred and, and uh, nobody really did anything about it. Uh, and so all of that. Um, on the other hand, if you come back here, there were Jews who were slave owners, a few. There was a guy named Judah Benjamin who was uh, 
who was the uh, uh, Secretary of War in the Confederacy. And I saw recently that a temple, uh, a reform temple in Charlotte, North Carolina, which had a picture of him up on the wall was just uh, taking that down. So, um, and then the, in terms of the Jewish involvement in, in the 60s, that, that when the Black Power movement especially started, there, were, there was a kind of rejection of, 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 by some of the Jewish role, which, um, which in truth did have elements of paternalism. Um, there's also been um, a lot of anti-Israel feeling um, in, uh, in the, in, back in those days and also uh, in the Black uh, Lives Matter movement today. Um, Still, the evidence shows that, that, Jew, that most Jews, I believe, support uh, the demonstrations that have been erupting across the country since George Floyd's uh, death. Uh, and if you ask uh, many Jews like myself, here's an interesting point, which maybe you know, I wanted to raise that um, if you ask me, uh, do I identify as a white person? The answer would be no. Um, as a physical reality, yes, it's undeniable. Uh, but 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 certainly not as something to identify with or to take pride in. Why not? Because I guess in, in this country, whiteness uh, tends to be synonymous with racism, and which has also included um, anti-Semitism. A couple of other personal things I wanted to share. One is the, the story of, of so much of my politics and my sense of vulnerability as a Jew were informed by my mother's experience, uh, which is something I write about in my book with Sabia Rechman, who's with us uh, today. Uh, my upcoming book, We Refuse to Be Enemies. Um, and uh, basically, both Sabia, my mother was a Holocaust refugee, as you'll hear, and, and Sabia's mother fled from, um, from India into Pakistan when the partition took place there. And both of them were, uh, went through you know, very difficult times. You could say were traumatized in some ways. Certainly in the case of my mother. My mother fled from Germany in 1938 at the age of 14 with her mother across the Belgian border, uh, literally ran across the border. They had actually paid off some Gestapo people, but um, they didn't know if they would be shot in the back or not. And then they, they got to France uh, soon after that, and where they were in Nice in the south of France. Um, but then the Nazis, as you know, a year or so later, conquered France. The Nazi, the war erupted, the Nazis conquered France. And they were running, my, my mother and grandmother, like trapped animals from one port to another, trying to get out, trying to get away from the Nazis. But they, but they were blocked, both by the, they couldn't go to Palestine because the British had imposed a blockade because of large Jewish immigra immigration into Palestine. And of course, that had led to conflict with the Palestinians. So that was out, and then, um, all, but the U.S. Um, had imposed very strict quotas on Jewish uh, immigration, and at the very those those quotas went back uh, 15 or so years earlier, and um, back to 1924, where they very consciously cut uh, immigration in this country uh, to basically trying to make it Northern European Protestants, uh, basically, and, and very few others. So at the moment when the Jews were in the greatest peril, America was keeping them out. And, um, and the policy at that time in 1940-41 was also called America First, by the way. Um, my, mother and her grand my mother and grandmother got to Lisbon, Portugal, but were on a long waiting list. They, uh, they, did get on, they finally got on a boat because they didn't know whether the Nazis were going to get there too, you know, where they could invade any day, and that would have been the end of them. But they got on a boat. They had visas, which again, they had purchased uh, to Ecuador. And the point was that they took a boat to New York and then they, from there they were supposed to catch a second boat to Ecuador, but they didn't have any intention of going to Ecuador if they could stay in the States. Um, and what happened was when they got to, um, they got to New York Harbor, the, um, the um, authorities allowed my grandmother and her sister who were with, was with her to go into the city to try to arrange for uh, someone who would, would, someone with the same last name who would, uh, you know, say so he, he would uh, take care of them. Um, but while that was going on, and that took about a week, they were being helped by HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which, uh, which my wife works for today and has a very long and you know, very inspiring history in this field. But in any case, um, while this was going on, my, my mother, my a teenage uh, girl of uh, now 16, was being held as surety on Ellis Island. So she was not allowed to leave while this was going on. Eventually, a New York City judge with the same last name, Ringel, uh, did sign an affidavit. And actually, the affidavit is fascinating because he was a person in some you know, position of authority, uh, you know, obviously a lawful person. But he said, yes, these are my 
relatives when in fact they hadn't known him before. So that's how, how they were able to stay in the States. The thing though that really uh, gets to me when I hear, when I hear uh, Trump and, and, and many others um, uh, talk about illegal immigrants, uh, you know, that, that, that it's, well, okay, it's okay to have legal ones, but not illegal. So my mother was an illegal at that moment also when she got to New York. And, you know, she, and why was she illegal? She was, she was fleeing for her life from, from, from war and oppression. And, and so, of course, I take that very personally. Um, but, and, and it makes me even more horrified when I hear about all the uh, demonization of, of Muslims and Asians and African, Africans and others people that Trump says came from shithole countries. And this is antithetical to the America where Jews can feel comfortable and feel safe. Wanted to share one other personal incident uh, because I, as I was saying to Fatima and Vanessa and, and Kofi when we met that I'm the oldest person I think of, of the speakers, I'm, I'm 70. And I can remember back to 1959 when I was nine years old and we took, my, my family took a trip to Tennessee. Uh, we lived in Pittsburgh and I remember the first we got into Virginia, Northern Virginia, I believe it was Winchester, um, and we, we went to, we stopped at a diner, and um, we stopped at the diner, and then I went to the, to the men's room, and uh, I suddenly see that there are four bathrooms, uh, white men, colored men, white women, and colored women. Uh, I still sort of can't even process that today, that I saw this with my own eyes, and I came back, and I said, Mom, Mom, there's four bathrooms. I sort of shouted, and she kind of went like, shh. You know, kind of looking around at all these southern white people and sort of being afraid of how they would respond. Um, so, so now we come to today and why don't Jews feel, um, why do Jews feel vulnerable in America today? Well, the Anti-Defamation League uh, began tracking uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes. Well, it's been doing that for, for four decades or more. And they said that two, in 2018, which I think it's 2018, there was brought the third highest spike on record. I don't know if we yet have the stats for 2019. Um, and um, Jews make up, as we know, less than 3% of the American population, but a majority of reported religious uh, hate crime, or relig religiously based hate crimes, target Jewish people and institutions um, and so forth. So there's a lot of studies that, uh, you know, that there's a lot of uh, strong anti-Semitism out there. Um, and then we have a president who claims to be philo-Semitic, pro-Israel, with a Jewish son-in-law and all of that, and yet he, um, he, he, he pushes bigotry in, in all the ways that Kofi and others uh, and, and the Congressman Byer spoke about, um, and, that has, and that leads to more anti-Semitism too. And never was this more clear uh, than with the mass shooting of 11 Jews at prayer, okay, I'm coming to the end, I guess, uh, at, in, at the Tree of Life, and uh, the largest mass uh, killing in, uh, against Jews in American history. Um, and, and he was killed specifically because the killer said that Jews were the pious. Again, the same Jewish agency was bringing, um, was responsible for bringing black, uh, dark skinned people into America. Um, last point, I woke up the next morning. I mean, I watched it, I was sort of, you know, stunned uh, that day. But the next morning I said, my God, I don't feel safe anymore. I mean, I'm 70 years old or at that point I was 68, I guess. I don't, for the first time in my life, I don't feel safe to be a Jew in America. And it was a very strange and, and, and very disconcerting and painful thing. And I was walking around with that feeling for I don't know how long. And then some point during that period, I said, well, wait a minute, I don't, that's right. I don't feel safe as a Jew, but on the other hand, um, and, and I'm at risk, but so are African-Americans, so are Muslims, so are Hispanics, so are gays, and so many other people um, who have been, who have been not only demonized, but murdered by white supremacists and, and suffered the same kind of consequences. So finally, the answer to all of this, in my opinion, is that our, our, of all the communities at risk, we need to stand up for each other and we need to stand uh, with all Americans of conscience against racism and bigotry. We simply cannot, as Jews, uh, be silent at this time. Our own salvation depend, uh, depends on it. For, my, um, for minority faith communities like Jews, Muslims, and others to thrive, we must have a, a pluralistic and inclusive America. And that's one of the reasons uh, Sabia and I are writing this book. Uh, so we advocate a Muslim Jewish alliance specifically uh, that with the two largest minority faiths standing up for each other together with working together with uh, Jew Americans of conscience, with all Americans of conscience. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Walter. That, that was quite comprehensive. Um, we, we lost the video of you for, for a while. You know what? I had my paper. I, 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 sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering what happened. And what, oh, boy. I thought I was keeping up to the side. But I, apparently. Yeah, okay. Well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad to see you back. Um, before we go any further, just really quickly, I just wanted to recognize a few people in the audience. Uh, we have uh, Barbara Favola and some elected officials, Barbara Favola. Um, wave again, Barbara. His, well, there you go. Okay. So Barbara Favola is um, a senator in the Virginia General Assembly um, for the 31st District, right? Thank you. Yes. Barbara, do you, do you want to just say a few words? Well, I was just going to uh, add something to what Congressman Beyer had started off saying and how important it is about the reporting of hate crimes. And, and I know I, I worked with Kofi on this. The, we did change legislation last year that will strengthen uh, Virginia's reporting requirements of hate crimes. In the past, it had been voluntary on the part of the police departments now they will be reporting to the state police and those crimes will be uh, subsequently reported to the FBI. So it's always good to have state statutes that mirror the federal statutes because it's easier for localities to actually enforce a state statute. So this is a good thing. And I just wanna compliment you Fatima for pulling this together. And, and you have wonderful, articulate, passionate panelists who understand this issue and are willing to share their personal stories. Things like this matter and they will help us change the culture. And that's really what we have to do is change our culture. So thank you. Absolutely. And, and thank you for Barbara for being here. We're honored by your presence. And um, you know, you, you, um, you remind us every day how much um, our public servants um, and you um, in their capacity, um, you know, as, as General Assembly members, as members of Congress, to really work to make our, all of our lives better. And so I'm, I'm honored to have both you and, and Congressman uh, Beyer here. And there's one other person that I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to recognize in the audience, and that is Takis Karantonis. Takis, will you please wave so everyone can see you? There you go. So Takis is the Democratic nominee for the Arlington County uh, Board. Um, he is running as a candidate for the Arlington County Board. Uh, just wanted to let everybody know uh, who doesn't know already um, that there is a special election. Um, one of our county board members, Eric Gutchell, passed away in April. Um, and uh, he, uh, we, we had to quickly, um, you know, we had to work with the uh, with the general assembly and and um, and the courts to figure out how to go forward and they recommended a um, uh, a special election so that's why we have a special election coming up on July seventh and um, Takas is um, Takas is the uh, democratic nominee for um, for the county board Takas would you like to say a few words while you're here um Sure, but very, very short. I, uh, first of all, thanks everybody for, for, uh, for being here, for discussing this, uh, for discussing this in our society. Uh, it, it, these are very difficult discussions to have right now in America because uh, sometimes, uh, very often, especially in the more affluent parts of the Eastern coast, we tend to forget what really is going on and what the unresolved issues have been in our country for a very long time. Um, and it took, uh, you know, the outrage of the Trump regime to call it, you know, in a charitable way uh, to uh, find out and to bring all this uh, unresolved problems back to the surface. Um, I do think that uh, you would really takes an entire the, the the effort of an entire society uh, to uh, to rebalance this to create a new culture and to get back uh, to a place that where we can have this these conversations and advance. Um, uh, therefore, uh, Fatima, so so grateful for for convening for being a convener and and going forward with that. Uh, myself, I'm an immigrant myself. Um, I. My, my entire family actually were, were immigrants. They came from various places um, from the East. 
to, to the West. Uh, they never, uh, you know, immigrated voluntarily. They have been forced to immigrate. Uh, so I, I understand. I, I get what it means to be a stranger somewhere, and I uh, perfectly understand what it means to be in a place that welcomes a stranger, uh, and how, how important that is, and how much we have to cherish that if we have it. But for now, we have to work uh, very hard to get it back. Uh, so that's, uh, that affects also your, your local government, definitely. We've seen things in Arlington, I, I believe I, I've seen in, in the chat a, a note from somebody who said in Arlington, we don't have overt racism, but we have a lot of covert racism. Um, unfortunately, in the last few weeks, we've seen also overt racism. And that's, um, and that's something that should be, you know, should be alarming us, uh, should raise a flag. So for that, with that, thank you very, very much. Elections on, on July 7th, but uh, you have more important things to, to discuss tonight. Not at all. Thank you, Takis, and we're, we're honored that you're that you're able to, to come tonight. Um, so I'll just repeat it again for anybody that hasn't heard it. Um, there is a special election on July seventh. If you're not registered to vote, well, it's probably too late. But I guess why aren't you? <laughs> okay, sorry, I had to sound like your mother, right? So, um, but there's still time for the general election. So. Please, if you are not registered to vote, register already. Okay, off my soapbox and on to the next, uh, onto the next phase of our, our, our event. Um, I understand that uh, Congressman Beyer has rejoined us. Um, Congressman Beyer, thank you so much for coming back and thank you for continuing to keep on top of all of you know, the important issues that um, that you that you know that you do to represent um, our, our district and, and our country. Um, I don't know if uh, you caught any of the um, the discussion, but um, there are a lot of there is a lot of personal sharing, um, talking about what it means to be and you know uh, an American Muslim today, what it means to be an American Jew today, what it means to be an African American, um, how these three groups, and these are, of course, just three, um, you know, sample representations of, you know, it's just a, it's, it's a tiny microcosm of the incredible mosaic that we have in this country of different groups. And, um, but I think they're, they're fairly representative of the, the issues that need to be addressed, um, and I think that that you are addressing through through the No Hate Act, through by by holding police departments accountable, um, at least on some level. And, and Barbara Favola, uh, Congress uh, Senator Barbara Favola has all, also done that um, in the General Assembly. And um, so uh, I just um, I don't know if I have any questions. I had some questions. I, I think uh, many of you answered them very well. One of the one of the questions was going to be, how can we, you know, I, I heard a lot of themes, and the major one being that we have to work together. And I and I think to me that's the one that resonates the most with me. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you. I'll just give you my quick personal experience and why I think it's so important. Um, as many of you know, I am the um, co-founder, former co-founder and former uh, co-lead of the Arlington chapter of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, a national organization that um, builds trust and um, relationships between Muslim and Jewish women. Um, as such, we work on a lot of projects, both on a local and national level, and we weigh in on, on issues of uh, of, of this kind that have to do with hate, bigotry, racism, we push back against that. And while a lot of people um, see what we do, they see religion as a, for, as a divisive force, we've sort of turned it on its head. We have decided that, nope, we're not, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to use it as a force to unify us. And so far, um, that has worked really wonderfully. Um, three and a half years into uh, 
our, uh, our chapters beginning back in 2017. Uh, we are still going strong. We now, uh, other chapters are forming and um, I, I see a couple of you sisters in the audience. So wave, whoever you are. All right, guys, thank you for being here. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just open it up to questions. Um, ask away. Hey, Fatima. Yes. This is Don. Hi, Don. <clears throat> Can I just add one thing to this? Because I was fascinated because I got to hear almost all of the, the comments. It, it occurs to me one of the most interesting things in Ibram Kendi's first book is that racist ideas are the result of racist policies. That we don't start off hating our brothers and sisters. We start off with um, institutions that um, are unfair, corrupt, and unequal, and then somehow we have to justify those institutions in our mind, which is why you find very few people who will admit that they're racist. Even Donald Trump doesn't admit that he's a racist, yeah. um, which leads us back to the idea that what we then have to do is change the institutions, change the policies, which is why something – and you talk about how do we change hearts – one of, the ways, one of the ways we change hearts is we change um, the structure of the world in which we live. So the, the Justice and Policing Act that we passed last Thursday night, uh, by the way, I, I heartily concur with, with Senator Favola, who says um, federal laws really need to trickle down to become state laws and, and local laws for, for maximum effect. But banning chokeholds, banning, uh, banning midnight raids, making lynching a federal crime, um, making sure that police don't have qualified immunity, et cetera. All the good things those bills do will change, not just how police react to everybody, including people of color, but it will also say, look, it's not okay for all these um, people of color to be killed by the police. It's absolutely, absolutely wrong. And, and, and it's easier that way somehow. I, I was trying to think of an important e example. All I can think of are trivial ones. But when I was a kid, we threw trash out the window of the car, and the, so, all the sides of all the roads were covered with trash. And then they made littering illegal with a big fine. And now almost nobody would do it because it's totally the wrong thing to do. But we changed the law first, and then the culture followed. Thank you. Uh... Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. So um, I think we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, Simon yeah. and Colin, do you want to ask some questions? Yeah. Um, so uh, Aliyah Khan has three questions. Um, will you support a party, a party platform that condemns Israel's taking over Palestinian territory? What is your position on a federally funded, locally administered job guarantee program as part of the Green New Deal that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at minimum wage starting um, at $15 per hour. And uh, what are some of the programs that you have supported in the past or plan to support in the future that help elevate the voices of the marginalized, of, marginalized, of these marginalized communities? Um, and then there's some other questions as well, but if you want to focus on those first three questions. Yeah, let's um, take one question at a time or, you know, one person with <laughs> all their questions at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And I think yeah. that question is directed to, um, I'm guessing, Congressman Beyer and possibly a Senator Vavola as well. Um, I'll leave it to, you know, <laughs> to, how, to you however you want to. I'll, I'll let Congressman Beyer tackle the Palestinian question. I don't know if he's still on the call. Um, yeah, and, and I yeah. can just say briefly, absolutely, we, were, we will condemn the annexation of Palestinian territory in every way possible. And I, I, I do think, not everyone agrees with me, but I think that this president has been awful on both Palestinian rights and statehood and independence, and also on the future of Israel that they continue to paint Israel into a corner from which it will be very difficult for it to stay democratic and Jewish. Um, I can, I'll take a crack at uh, the question 
I think was intended to uh, get to what kind of safety net do we want to provide to ensure that all of our marginalized communities and our low income folks can really participate as fully as possible. Hey, doctor. In our economy and, and in educating their children and breaking the cycle of poverty. There are some jurisdictions, and actually, there's a jurisdiction in Texas that is um, doing a pilot program on providing $1,000 a month to families below a certain income bracket. And I apologize, I don't know what that threshold is. But um, this was one of the proposals that are a candidate seeking the Democratic nomination for president um, had had promoted. And actually, you know, there are in, there are some studies out there that good thing. So are you. that show folks will, in fact, make wise decisions if given enough income, they will save for college. They will, in fact, try to, to find safe housing um, and they'll be able to afford a little bit more. They will, in fact, try to make decisions, and there's evidence that show this, to, to pull themselves up. So I think those studies need to get out there because getting back to Congressman Byers' point about, you know, people sort of justify racism after these policies are implemented, which in fact keep people down is a very valid point. I mean, w there's a lot of rumor out there that, oh, poor people wouldn't know how to spell money, spend money wisely, or poor people would spend money on drugs. Fact of the matter is, fact of the matter is, fewer, a, a smaller percentage of low income people are on drugs you know, uh, you would say illegal drugs, than the general population. And again, that's been proven time and again. So, so um, th those, those things are really important. And those, those safety net programs do come through my committee uh, in Richmond, um, the Rehab and Social Services Committee. We were able to actually improve reentry programs for those coming out of prison and allow them to access TANF dollars, which they could never do before. That's temporary assistance to needy families. Uh, and those primarily, those dollars were going to mothers with children. And Virginia for years would not remove the ban on accessing that money, even after people had done their time in prison, if it happened to have been related to a drug um, um, charge. So I'm proud to say, as I, I patroned uh, those re-entry bills, which, which was great. And, and we're looking at all kinds of things. And I hope that the conversation that you're helping to facilitate and that the whole country is helping to, uh, to get involved with will, uh, will force a true examination of all of these policies and a sort of, in, in a starting with the, you know, the police brutality that we have been observing and, and have been trying to reckon with over these past few months. I'm sorry, Congressman Byer, did you want to jump in? He might have had to, I hope he, he didn't have, have to leave and take, okay, he may have had to take a vote. He might have, yeah, he might have had to leave. Um, okay, so let's go on to some other questions. Uh, Fatima, I, I just wonder if I might very briefly address uh, the, quite the first question about uh, Israel-Palestine, uh, sure, I think it may be me if we have a minute. Yeah, um, sure. So I think, um, well, first of all, I, I, you know, many, many people in the Jewish community, myself included, um, would, would agree with the, the, the position that Congressman Bayer, Bayer just laid out, that, that, that the annexation is wrong and immoral on its face. And that's a, and so again, the, there's, the, the community is split on that, but I do even think the majority, there have been some polls that have shown are, are post, uh, American Jews are opposed to it. Where there has been some, some difficulties um, is um, you, we, we keep seeing this drumbeat in the Jewish community and the Jewish press about uh, Black Lives Matter supposedly being anti-Semitic. And they'll point to quotes like the following, which I jotted down the, uh, from the 2016 platform of BLM saying, the US justifies and advances the global war on terror via its alliance with Israel and it's complicit and is complicit in the genocide taking place against the Palestinian people. So that's already, you know, a, a different level. And I think that that um, gets a lot of Jews very much on edge and, and feels 
uh, even anti-Semitic. So this is a very, very tough issue. And first of all, I, I just want to say one or two things, quick things. I think it's very, very important that we really try to keep our eyes on the ball. And this is about building alliances here at home and not letting let ourselves be diverted by by the Middle East situation. Um, you know, and it's being used as a wedge issue by Trump and the Republicans to to drive us apart, to split us Muslims and Jews apart. You know, the attacks on Ilhan Omar and Rashid is played by by Trump saying go back where you came from and 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 many other things. So there there is the, the sensitivity does exist and and I think part of what I would just try to share, you know, is that I think of dealing with the Middle East, dealing with Israel and Palestine, it's an existential tragedy what 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 has happened there, and I don't think it's about good guys and bad guys, and I think we. Um, I, I, I'll just close with one thing. I'm working now. I'm involved in Project Rosanna. We're raising. Uh, which is uh, a, an NGO, um, uh, international NGO, which includes Muslims, Jews, and and others. And, and here in the in the uh, DMV, we're raising we're raising money to get pa uh, ventilators to the Palestinian Authority. Um, so that's an example of something that we can actually do together that has a positive effect over there, saves lives over there, which is what uh, both Islam and Judaism is one of the whole, the most inspiring, um, you know. Um, the pieces of both the, uh, the, uh, the um, Quran and the Talmud, that if you save one life, it is as though you've saved all of humankind. So thanks so much for he hearing that. Thank you, Walter. Um, I'm just uh, mindful of time. We're kind of getting towards the end and I wanna take a few more questions. Simon, do we have some more questions? Yeah, uh, there are a number, of, uh, there are a bunch of great questions. Um, like, uh, sorry, I'm just going through the chat. Um, how do we check our own biases, biases when dealing with, when dealing with this work? Um, and there was one directed towards, uh, uh, again, Don Bayer, um, that wasn't addressed, but, um, you can talk, you can ask as well. Uh, there's also like other ones like, um, is qualified immunity included in any of the bills? Um, immunity is an issue that prevents police accountability. Uh, what can we do to sustain, we went to the world before, what can we do to sustain the passion to root out racism from our society? Um, um, Simon, we- Yeah, sorry. Let's, I'm let's just do one question at a time, unless so they're sorry. all asked by the same person. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, a lot at once, yeah. So I think a maximum okay. two questions, and they don't necessarily have to be attributable to anybody, but just, yeah, just questions. I guess uh, the first one is like, is qualified immunity included in any of the bills? Um, immunity is an issue. This is from Sabiha Reman. Uh, Reman, and Reman, uh, please let me please let me know um, uh, how to pronounce your name correctly as well, so I I can remember for the future. Um, but uh, Sabiha uh, asked, is qualified immunity included in any of the bills? Um, Fatma, I'm going to jump in and um, take that first question that he asked about um, self-reflection and seeing what we as individuals can do sure. to check in our own racist biases. Something that I, I've been working on with myself and my family and my friends is to kind of walk through your own life and see how you're interacting with people within the Black community here in the United States or wherever you are, right? And, and see what it is that you are reacting to and how it is you're reacting to. For instance, within a lot of the Muslim countries, um, although racism, we're, we're not supposed to be racist as Muslims, right? Because it's against our faith. We're supposed to love everybody. We do have people who are racist. And showcasing that within ourselves is extremely important because a lot of the things that we do, we think that it's not, we're not racist. For example, a girl could come home who is maybe from an Asian country, her parents are from an Asian country, she was born and raised here, and she meets a guy who happens to be black and she wants to marry him, he happens to be Muslim or he's gonna to convert to become Muslim, and, the, and her family is completely saying no, only because he's black. But they will never say they're racist, right? They're like, I'm not racist, I'm not hurting black people, I'm not uh, discriminating against them in the job place, I'm not saying that they're all criminals, but my daughter cannot marry someone who's black, so, well, but that's being racist, right? So we have to point these things out, not only within ourselves, but within our family members as well. Because these types of conversations 
go under the radar because when it comes to our own self-reflection, we can't be racist, right? Because then that would mean that we're so bad, but it doesn't mean that we can't change those ideals, that we can't change the, where, the way we're processing things that are coming within our lives. We have to really look at things for what they are. Or even in organizations, how many people on the board or in your, uh, of your, the employees are Black? Look at that, you'll, you'll be you know, astonished that a lot of organizations don't have a lot of Black um, employees or people on the board serving as leaders, leadership positions. Why is that? Why is it, you know, in certain organizations, in faith-based groups, they're usually from a certain background. These are the things that we have to be mindful of, and these are the things that we have to actually vocalize and making sure that we're, we're getting the information out, but also checking ourselves and the people who are living with us. So starting within ourselves and how we're interacting with other people is a great way to actually self-reflect and see our own issues within ourselves. Thank you, Hori, that for, for that very insightful um um, you know, observation. Um, so any other questions? Anything, can anybody else want to follow, you know, have, do they have a comment about what, what Hori said and how, um, yeah. you know, how, we, how we might address our own biases? I think that's something that some people talked about. Uh, Amy Stone said, we whites have been woke before. What can we do to sustain a passion without racism from our society? Um, no one wants to lose power, and that includes the police unions, which will be fighting to change. And so that's her question. And, and who is the question for? Um, Amy, do you want to I, I, I guess it's like, I guess, I'm not sure what her, what, if it's a, particular question for anyone in particular. I think it's 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 a general it's I'm I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Amy, if you're here, I mean, I don't I'm I do not want to butcher your words, so Okay. All right. Sorry. Anybody wanna anybody wanna take that question on? I think uh, Amy had her hand raised. No no just it. whoever has the wisdom that could help me here. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Basically, the question is, we, there, there's been such a, a feeling of change since George Floyd's death and the mammoth ongoing demonstrations and a deep call for change. And we've been here before. And what's going to make the difference now? And part of the issue is no one wants to give up power. And that includes the police departments and the police unions. Yeah, well, um, so, so thanks, Amy. Um, and, and that is, that is, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I, I do believe that any organization inherently um, tries to hold on to as much control and power as it can. Um, I don't think, I think we almost have to look past the police at this point and look directly to our legislators in order to, um, to, 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 to be the change that we're, we're, we're hoping for. Um, I've, I've worked, you know, had, and had some success working with the police department um, here in Fairfax for the um, for last few years. But I also understand that if, if they thought that they were doing something wrong, they wouldn't be doing it, right? So um, it's a little bit unfair to ask them to totally change the way they're, they've been operating and for the last you know, hundreds of years. Um, and so if we want to have a new model of, of policing, then we're going to have to, um, it's going to have to be from the, from the outside, it's going to have to be a top down um, approach. So that's. If I could just add to that, I think, you know, if I, if I understand what Kofi's saying, I think it really comes down to awareness. And, um, you know, it's, it's not that they're not aware that they're doing something wrong. It's that, you know, they don't think that because it's been in, because racism has been institutionalized for so long, it, they don't really even think about it too much anymore. Um, and anyway, I, I would love to go on, but we are coming up against, we're coming up to the, uh, to the witching hour and we're all gonna turn into pumpkins if we don't wrap this up pretty quickly. So um, oh. I am going to, uh, 
Barbara, did you have something you wanted to say? Right? I will be very, very quick. And just to, uh, re just to respond to Kofi's comment, which of course is right on, um, the Senate Democrats are going around the state with Zoom meetings, uh, listening to, uh, to as many voices as we can about what needs to change regarding policing. We are coming up with a very robust legislative package. The House of Delegates is, is uh, also holding listening sessions. And I just, on a, on a note of hope, when we return to Richmond in August, we will come up with some transformational changes that we will need partners in the community to help us implement, but they will make a difference. Yeah, and, and if I could just take 10 seconds to just let everyone know that um, I am also part of a statewide coalition that is working on putting forth some police reforms. And we've had a series of meetings across the state over the last two weeks. And we have come up with a, a, a package that we are calling the, the uh, Reimagining Police Package. And um, if you're interested in joining this effort, email me at transformingpolice at gmail.com. And um, there's opportunities to sign up for different committees and such if you're, if you're interested. So. Okay. Well, uh, Kofi, with that, I'm just going to have to. All right, Ken, go ahead real quick. No, I just wanted to reach out to the panelists if we don't run out of time, but for this group, we've heard a lot of great things. I wanted them to say in a couple of words, how can this group, what are some of the next steps we can do as a group to support some of the things we're hearing about here? I just wanted to get that in before we adjourn. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I guess we can take five more minutes if everyone is, I don't know what everybody's schedule is. Um, yeah, go ahead, five more minutes. I, I will just say that um, has, has passionate as the, the uh, protesters have been and as articulate so many people have been in pointing out that we, you know, we need change, we need a more accountability on the part of the police and we need to be able to ensure that our values are, are reflected in our police departments, that de-escalation is put in place, that mental health professionals go out on police calls, et cetera, et cetera. As much as we want that to happen, this will not be easy. Uh, we need you to, you know, pay attention to write to your lawmaker. I mean, the Arlington lawmakers are, reflect the Arlington values, but we have to work with committees. I have a committee that, you know, has 15 people on it. Um, one person comes from Arlington, me, and, and you know, um, we, we, need to, we need to inform other lawmakers about how important it is to, to make these changes. And it's going to, the police unions will, will be pushing back. Um, you know, we're going, to, we're going to hear from all kinds of stakeholders who will not share our vision for, for a transformational uh, package. So, so to the degree this group can get involved in, in groups that Kofi is heading and um, and others, you know, it would be helpful. We, we need to have people show up at our hearings. We need to hear stories and we need to hear from you. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. And you know, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's really about participation and it's about not just, I think Kofi said, you know, there's all this anger and then it just ends and it turns into apathy. We cannot let it turn to apathy. You know, we need to, act now and, and move forward um, and and use that anger as a springboard for action. So um, with that, I'm going to close out this meeting. Thank you, Barbara, for, and, and thank you, uh, Congressman Beyer, if you're still on the call. Um, and uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone, including, you know, our wonderful panelists. Thank you for being here. Um, and to the Arlington Democrats for making this possible and for all of you for, for attending. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll wish you all a, a, a great evening. Just to know, just to let you know, we're, we're going to have the resources, we're gonna have some resources posted on our Facebook group page. So um, go to Facebook and type in, I don't have the link right now. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, has a moment to just sort of put it in the chat box, but um, you, if you go to Facebook and uh, in the uh, short search, search window, put uh, Arlington Dems Interfaith Caucus, um, it will bring you right to our Facebook group page. 
um, and please uh, feel free to uh, to join as a member. We would love to have you. We would love to have your input. And finally, please don't forget to ha uh, to fill out the evaluation form. We really do uh, want to know what you think. Okay. Okay, everyone. Good night. Thanks again. Bye. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you so much, to everyone, for participating. Yeah. And for participants. Thanks, really everyone. You guys coming out to, to do this. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everyone, for making this Bye. happen. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Appreciate the rich discussion. And don't forget Thank to you. vote. <laughs> and take the census. And take the census. And make sure to fill out the evaluation form at the end. And we'll be seeing it around. That's right. Okay, guys.